since before I was born, I think that the Sinaloa cartel or whatever the cartel was at the time always had their links into, you know, a city like Chicago. Uh, when I was born, actually, my father was in prison. He was a drug trafficker, a big drug trafficker who worked with different organizations. And, you know, he was a big heroin dealer. And that was my introduction to the drug trade through my father. At an early age, he started teaching me and my brother, you know, the business of drug trafficking. You know, we ran our first load across the border at before we were eight years old. Obviously, El Chapo um, as such an infamous name. He wasn't easy to deal with, that's for sure. Our, you know, our first dealings with him, just to make it clear, you know, uh, his organization kidnapped my brother. <laughs> Here we go, a boom uh, with no uh, video, just audio right now because the guest, Margarito Flores, also known as Jay, short for Junior, um, is preferring not to show his face because he was a cooperator with the US government against Sinaloa Cartel, against El Chapo against Arturo Beltran Leyva, against El Mayo. In fact, his evidence uh, was using indictments against more than 50 drug traffickers. But he was also a drug trafficker himself at a major level. He confessed along with his twin brother, Pedro Flores, also known as Pete, to trafficking more than 60 tons of cocaine as well as heroin and crystal meth. If you're an American, if you're somewhere up on the East Coast, or in fact anywhere in the United States, and had a line of cocaine between about 1998 and 2008, there's a very good chance it went through the Flores Twins organization. Uh, but now he is looking for redemption. He's done some time in prison, 12 years, as well as cooperating came out and is looking to try and change things. Now, in this conversation, you can find Margarito around other places. A lot of you will be familiar with him from other places. Now, he's been more of a, a media presence. This conversation is more of a uh, candid, casual talk. Uh, I got in touch with him and he was very generous with his time. You know, what became a short conversation turned into a long conversation. And so this is this is that that talk. What was it like in Chicago, growing up in Chicago, and that first links into trafficking and to linking up with the biggest players in Mexico? Oh, well, for the most part, um, you know, since before I was born, I think that the Sinaloa cartel or whatever the cartel was at the time always had their links into you know a city like Chicago. I think. As migrants and Mexicans started actually migrating into Chicago, you know, for most people that don't know, I was like born into this, right? Uh, uh, when I was born, actually, my father was in prison. He was a drug trafficker, a big drug trafficker who worked with different organizations. And, you know, he was a big heroin dealer who was uh, arrested for, uh, you know, 11 kilos of black tar heroin at the time, received a 10 year sentence. And uh, after a good time, he, he was he came home when I was around seven, seven and a half. And that was my introduction to the drug trade through my father. At an early age, he started teaching me and my brother, you know, the business of drug trafficking. You know, we ran our first load across the border at before we were eight years old. You know? Wow. wow. So, mm -hmm. so when you, ran up, you went down with him to Mexico and you were like, what, he was driving in a car over the border? Or how did he get it over? Oh, so, yeah, we actually thought it was a vacation. We went uh, to Mexico on our, you know, first trip out of Chicago. You know, we were, you know, my father was in prison and, you know, we had a hard life, you know, grew up very poor. You know, my family was on, on uh, government assistance at the time. So uh, he came home and he was a provider at heart. You know, he was used to having money and, and he felt, I guess it was like his obligation to, you know, provide and provide money fast. So we took the, you know, it was small car, took the road to Mexico, uh, 
it was a, it was a fun experience for my brother and I for sure. Um, went down to Mexico and basically on that trip, he actually took us out to the mountains and basically introduced us to our first drug, which was going to be marijuana. And we, um, he took us through every step where we were, you know, a part of the, you know, cultivating of it, the harvesting, right? Picked out which plants he wanted. You know, we had to let them sit and dry out and all that stuff and compress the marijuana at that time into, you know, was considered Mexican, right? Marijuana into some you know, it was 220 pounds, I believe. And that and was we, in Sinaloa or where, where was that in Mexico? No, at that time, we actually went, it was, we went to, to the uh, mountains in what was considered the Zacatecas, Durango, right? That area on this side of it. Um, and, you know, my father at that time had, you know, knew many people. And that's our, I guess that's where our education started. Um, we, he taught us how to, you know, take down the gas tank. And uh, we we fished out the you know the gas I mean the drugs right the gas from the gas tank and and we're witness and helped them in every part of it and that's what was going to be the next you know that's what going to be our job for the next you know three to four years I think uh, and um, we took our our first ride back up to the United States when when we actually got to a border it was going to be our first time we were interrogated by federal officers I tell everyone. My dad and my, my mom didn't bring our birth certificates on our first trip. And my father had, you know, 220 pounds of, of, of marijuana hidden in a gas tank with no birth certificates <laughs> for my brother and I. So, of course, you know, uh, Custom Border Patrol uh, sent us to a second inspection. But we were twins. That, you know, me and my brother twins. We looked alike. At that time, you know, there was not a lot of twins. We were still like a big deal that we looked so much alike. And um, they took separated from our parents and my father I, I always recall this it was the first time I actually like remember like not understanding something when he said don't say nothing like I knew exactly what he meant but he was worried that they were going to separate us right and, and, they, and didn't, they didn't think to search for the marijuana they didn't think to search the no but my I remember seeing my father it was like a you know where they they inspected the cars it was like an office and it had glass it was all glasses and I could see my father pacing back and forth what was it like? I mean, did you consider, I mean, when you're like eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old doing that stuff, did you kind of think I'm not like a regular kid here in school? My life's a bit of a kind of crazy movie or or, or what, how did you process that as a kid oh, wow. having that experience compared to everyone else in your class? Who's like, you know? Yeah. I, you know what? That's a good question. I can't explain this to the committee a little bit. You know, I didn't have your regular childhood. I'm not saying I had deal. I was the only one but at that time growing up in in the states even growing up in a place like little village it's a it's a working class neighborhood we were different even early on because everyone had their mom and their dad you know we still have that generation of mexicans that don't believe in divorce people went to work every day our dad being in prison was still rare like so we were already kind of like mm, treated a little bit different because of that but you know, I have older brothers and ignorance, right? You know, what gang culture was like. Uh, all his friends, the whole neighborhood basically would hang out at our house when we were kids because there was no father to, you know, say no. Or, you know, my mom just would be like, oh, okay, this is what friends do. And uh, and that's kind of started the trend of like our family being looked at a little bit different, right? You know, to other families who come from Mexico, right? Settle down there, go to work every day. And here's his house, right? That's rare. There's no father. And there's a bunch of, you know, uh, teenagers that have a bunch of friends who are, you know, gang members. Now, what, and, kind of gang, what kind of gang were they in? And what gang were they in? And, and you never you never got into the gang life yourself on that side of things. You know what? My, my brothers were growing up. I mean, they were uh, what was considered probably the most violent, the most organized organization, which was the Land Kings. And that's going to play a big part on, you know, my brother's drug trafficking time. And, uh, but, you know, we're talking about my, you know, seven, eight years old. So for sure, I was already, you know, kind of uh, living that part of the world where my brother was, you know, a Lion King. My brother's 15 years older than me. You know, at that age, I still growing up, I'm, I'm basically being raised in that kind of culture, that, those environments. So by the time, you know, my father comes around, uh, him being in prison in the state, actually. 
he comes from you know being around gang members uh so he uh, wasn't happy about it he kicked my brothers out the house fast it was it didn't take long like what, what's going on you know like he he despised gang members believe it or not uh it, it's just this weird contradiction yeah. Yeah, uh, he buys them because he was in prison with them. He didn't understand, you know, you know, their reasoning or why they would, you know, have to like what we consider in Chicago gangbang or whatever. But um, for instance, him coming home and kicking my older brothers out the house kind of pushed them away to having to provide for themselves now. In a real manner, which led them to drug trafficking. And and here I am, you know, you know that separation between my older brothers and me and my uh, twin brother is like he's giving us an education here, and they're learning the cocaine business on the streets. Okay, just taking a quick break here, uh, just to say if you like this podcast, if you like my work, and you want to find more of it, then please go on to www.crashoutmedia. Dot com that's c r a s h o u t m e d i a dot com that's where you can see loads of my stories my podcasts interviews with active cartel members interviewed with former cartel members law enforcement dan crenshaw and congress in the anti cartel task force analysis reportage and everything about organized crime and drugs trying to find truth trying to find answers trying to find better ways here you could subscribe for free or if you like it and want to support it and get access to everything then just five dollars a month gets you in there the, I think the gang culture being around in that envir environment uh taught my brother and i a lot it was going to teach us how to succeed in in, in that environment later but we also never joined a gang. You know, my older brother, that's something that he forbade us and, and made sure he didn't. Uh, by the time I was 12, 13 years old, and my dad went on the run again, left us where I was a brother. He was already, you know, a kingpin himself um, in the cocaine business. Now, how, how much school did you do? How, how... I actually went to high school. Um, I was actually... You know, this is a good question. No one ever asked me that, but I was actually, uh, for the most part, my brother and I actually did really well in school. Um, we ended up going to a public high school right in my neighborhood. And uh, in my junior year, uh, I was actually kicked out of school by um, law enforcement. You know, them understanding who we were, they felt like, you know, I wasn't part of a gang at that time no way involved in gangs, but that was the environment we were in. And my older brother was, uh, you know, he was a shot caller. Mm. And them understanding that part of it, it's like they kind of didn't, you were trying to clean up the school and basically gave us an ultimatum and uh, we were kicked out of school. But then I actually ended up getting a diploma by an alternative of uh, like high school where you go, basically it's like a GD, but fast track, you know, and, and got a high school diploma. My twin brother did actually attend uh, college. He did a few semesters in college. Um, but by then, we were already, you know, in our own world of drug trafficking. So You became very big, very young in terms of, in terms of numbers in trafficking. Mm -hmm. Did it just blow up? Like, did you start mm -hmm. kind of small? It just grew and grew and grew very fast? Or did you see yourselves right away, like, as kind of entrepreneurs in this? Or how did you... How did things escalate so fast? I guess with my background, right? With my father, you know, being in Mexico, that's what people, like, I, I feel like there's two sides of us. You know, growing up in Chicago, growing around, up around those gangs and that culture. And then growing up in Mexico where my father made sure he introduced us to everyone and 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 made sure we treated everyone with respect. And come, coming from a small town, which was like my second home, as you know, it's all about respect how you treat people, mannerisms, you know, what your last name was and how we carried ourselves, I think came naturally through my father. And so, um, you know, by the time we're 13, 13 going on to 17, we basically become um, my older brother's helpers in the business. And he, by that time, is working with the Juarez cartel, the Sinaloa cartel. You know, it was still one organization and, um, 
and just being around the business all day, being around his associates, you know, I was able to, to understand the, the, even the Sinaloa or the cartel slang back then, you know, when, when people were wearing silk shirts with open with the gold chains and stuff like that and being around them and uh, being around, you know, both environments where my brother actually went from being the kingpin in the neighborhood to actually starting to distribute, you know, especially to black gangs in Chicago. Uh, and I was able to actually be a part of that and everything I was learning at the time. Um, so when my brother got indicted, I was just turning 17. It's like uh, one of his sources of supply, which was going to be a important person later on in, in the Sinaloa cartel, um, sent for my brother and I and, you know, offered us a load of, of drugs, which was at that time, our first deal was going to be our own deal was going to be of 30 kilos of cocaine, which is, you know, at that time, you know, for someone like, you know, I was 17 and it being our first deal, like it didn't seem like a lot for us, but it was a lot, you know, under the circumstances. We sold our first 30 kilos that day, you know, received 50 kilos the next day. And basically by the time we were 18, we were already moving anywhere from three to 400 kilos a month. And I guess, you know, that's going to, that started off like a, a run, I guess that, you know, just seeing the business, you know, as a business and seeing the other side of it, I think uh, not being part of a gang, the way we were raised, I think that that helped, helped us a lot and having those relationships, you know, from early on and being able to, you know, be businessmen, I think are, is what kind of propelled us. Um, um, by the time I was 19, 20, uh, we were pushing well over a thousand kilos in a month in Chicago. You know, I explained this, like, this is without me ever going to Mexico. Like, this is, the drugs are already in Chicago. I'm being basically a wholesale distributor for the for the Sinaloa cartel. And at that time, for the Gulf cartel. Uh, uh, me, I have no direct ties to them. I'm, you know, I have a middleman. And, I, you know, I'm 18, 19 years old, 20 years old. I'm making two, three million dollars a month. Now, 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 look. Like do you think you were kind of in the right place at the right time or, 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 or the fact you had such good connections and it was when, I mean, what, why did, how did you blow up so fast? Uh, 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 or is just the, the nature of the drug game? What do you think looking back on it now, what made you just become this big, this far? Just to make it clear, you, you, you know, this with your background, mm. just doesn't, the drug trafficking is not easy. There's a, you know, people fail at it every day. Mm. So, um, I don't know if my brother and I knew what a successful drug trafficker was other than, you know, what we would see in the news at that time, which was like the Lord of the Skies or Caro Quintero. Uh, the movie Scarface to us was also a great movie, but it never motivated us to die like him. I think, you know, it's that story. Right. And I feel like what made my brother and I successful that somehow, some way growing up, we never wanted to be like anyone else. Mm. We always said, you know, this, like, we never changed who we were. Uh, we got into business, you know, for economics reasons. And we it, we never let anything, you know, change that. That we were there for one reason. We were obviously, I, I feel like, intelligent enough not to get involved in certain situations. But also, I think it goes back to who we how we were raised. The simple principles that people take for granted. Respect doing the right thing, you know, going out your way for others sometimes. Like some of this stuff that sounds like you're, 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 I'll be talking about the Bible, but in the drug trade, it was always about what type of person you were. And that is what actually I felt like took us, you know, from where we started and where we're going to end up at, you know, um, you know, all those you know, simple things that people think that are not necessity. Right. Made, I think also is our parents. We were young. Mm. You know, they didn't think, take us as a threat. I didn't want to be taken as a threat. So that made, you know, the people we were involved with and associates, it made them more comfortable. And then in return, kind of, uh, we would build these friendships or these relationships with people. And, you know, it was, I, I think for them, it's always like, I know these guys ain't going to do me wrong. Mm. But in reality, it's not because I was fearful. It's just that that wasn't who we were. Um, and I think that actually helped us and it helped us all along the way, actually helped us solidify some of the, you know, those relationships we have with the biggest jugglers in the world. 
that I didn't want to be them. So when you did meet Chapo, you met Chapo, you met Arturo Beltran Leva? Yes, Arturo Beltran Leva. I mean, who I met, I met probably, you know, some of the biggest jugglers. I met Nacho Coronel. Okay. Alfredo, Alfredo Beltran Leva, um, uh, Mayo Zambada. Zambada, okay. Sent, um, wow, I mean, you know, big jugglers. I worked with Lobo Valencia um, from the Millennial Cartel, Mancho. Okay. Uh, so, you know, in, in our time from like working with, you know, you know, in Chicago to our time in Mexico, like, you know, we dealt with, you know, Azul's sons, right? You know, he's deceased now. Like, I mean, too many people to actually, you yeah. know, name, uh, uh, that we had some type of association with, you know, or, or understanding, you know, from Los Queenies to, to uh, Noel Salgado to, I mean, there's so many individuals that we're uh, around or associated with or did business with, you know. Obviously, El Chapo um, has such an infamous name. And, and obviously, you know, later on you testified. What did you think of him as a person? What was he like on a personal level to deal with? Mm, he wasn't easy to deal with, that's for sure. You know, if you take down, you know, all the drug lords actually – had business relationship with, he was probably the most difficult one, uh, which is, you know, something that people don't really realize. Um, our, you know, our first deals with him, you just to make it clear, you know, uh, his organization kidnapped my brother at that time, which was uh, Chapo Cidro was still part of his organization. It was his, you know, under his command, he would, you know, Chapo Cidro, who now is, you know, ahead of his own organization, he's going to actually, you know, be a friend of mine later, but my brother was kidnapped by him um, over a debt. And uh, even when he had evidence that, you know, we didn't owe the debt, he still made me pay on his money. And um, he was a lot harder to deal with that we would rather deal with other people like his underlings because they were more on the business side. And, you know, we would just take care of the business, you know, and, and kind of try to keep him on a you know, need to know basis for, you know, but for sure he, he wasn't uh, that easy to deal with. Um, I also think it was because he did look at my brother and I as real, like as businessmen. And he always knew that, you know, we were going to try to push, you know, as much as we could. And and to him, he, you know, he, his, uh, he had a strong demeanor. So uh, I guess we would just try to get away, uh, get away with as much as we could, as you could tell in the recorded call, right? Yeah. That wasn't you, him, us asking him, you know, what, what bothered him, which people don't realize is that, in the drug business, you don't do that. You don't receive a shipment of drugs and then try to get a better price once you have them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, 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 like, the prices you deal with these, this is a bricks of cocaine. Uh, Just to make it clear, tons, right? Tons of cocaine. Uh, tons of cocaine, okay. You're negotiating we by, by tons by this time. So what kind mm -hmm. of price, I mean, what price would you pay them and what price would you sell at? Oh. Profit margin on the... Uh, yeah. So the business, I mean, consists of different deals, right? I mean, it's kind of complex, right? Because that's a book on its own. Mm. For the most part, uh, we enter into a partnership, right? That's what the cartel is, right? It's, it's a group, group of people, right? Working together, you know, for one cause, which was, you know, at that time was to make money. And uh, basically, there was times like we would set our own price, which was going to be the fairest price you know, the cheapest price in whatever city we were actually receiving the drugs at. And people, uh, just to make it clear, uh, we never took advantage. It was like, what's the price? And if we said the price is this and I need them for this, then that's what it was. But rest assured that they were not going to come back and say, did you just like, you know, like I, w I didn't have to. I wasn't asleep good at night to make sure that it was a fair business, that they were never going to come back and say, hold on. Are you taking advantage of, you know, what you're doing? So they, um, for the most part, the organizations, the cartels respected our business acumen, how we viewed things, how we did things. So, you know, we basically set the price or we'll negotiate when it came to Mexico. And they always gave us a. a you know, 10, 15% at cost, you know, just to make sure that our organization, you know, was making money and could keep up um, any of the losses.
So what would the numbers be? I mean, like, would you buy for, say, 12K and sell for 18K or what would the kind of um, be? Yeah, again, depending on what, you know, what the business was. If we were coming from Colombia, obviously it's different, but just say if it was, um, if we were receiving a shipment of drugs in LA um, and just say that was the price, it was 12,000, then, you know, I would sell it in Chicago for 19.5, you know, or in DC for 25. You know, depending on where we're going, you know, Canada, we would sell them for, you know, 38,000, 40,000, whatever the case, you know, different price, we would, you know, and different regions had different prices and we, we would base it off of that. How, how, I mean, the network for moving it around the United States, I mean, was this with, you know, it was, it was, it was trucks, I understand, with trailer trucks. I mean, you, you buy, you, you create your own trucking companies or you just get truck drivers to carry it or how does that whole business work of, of moving it around the USA? Yeah, so the means were, were there's a lot of means, right? But for the most part, um, as I try to point out, you know, our organization being successful and I was working with, you know, um, the Sinaloa cartel at that time as a whole, right? Because you, know, you do have different people that have different methods, you know, but for the most part, how big organizations work, um, they're going to work with something that's going to be continuous, something that, you know, um, they have different projects going at one time. But for us, you know, we did use trains, we did use airplanes, we did use uh, uh, different, you know, transportation means. But for the most part, it was uh, tractor trailers, long haul um, uh, semis. So that was our, our mean of transportation and, uh, what we would do would we would actually find independent contractors, uh, independent drivers that had their own, you know, that worked as independent contractors, and you know, find legitimate loads and haul them across, you know, the country. So some of the other people you're dealing with in Mexico, I mean, the, the big big names. So obviously, uh, El Mayo. What would you think of uh, of El Mayo as a, as an individual? Uh, you know, he's kind of a mythical status now. But what's well, he like on a on a personal level? This is a tricky part. Uh, I'm talking about, you know, how I felt with him, you know, back at that present time. I, you know, when I'm talking about something, when it comes back to my life, I always like to put myself in that, you know, f mindset, state, and and feeling. You know, to me, he reminded me a lot of, you know, even nicer probably than my father. He took a liking to my brother and I. Uh, we had a very good relationship. You know, he was a fierce man, but he was also one of the, you know, most, I think, fairest. Like, he was, you know, like, it's hard to explain. Um, our, he, I do feel like he had genuine, like, love and respect for us because uh, he looked at us young and, you know, he had enough people in his organization that he respected that had nothing but good things to say about us. So early on, he welcomed them, welcomed us. And he was actually, when it came to prices, when it came to any type of business, he was the one that would be like, whatever you guys decide. And you know what? Here's an extra, you know, some things for, you know, for you guys. So, um, yes, um, it doesn't surprise me that he continues to be, you know, the head of the organization and and the most successful one, for sure. How about uh, Arturo Beltran Leva? Now on the business side, I think he's unmatched when it comes to business. Uh, he was fair. He was probably I, what I consider to be in, in terms of economics, probably at that time, he was probably making more money than Chapo and, and Mayo easily. Um, his organization basically depended on people like me where, you know, he would bring, you know, large amounts of, of drugs into, you know, Mexico and other places in the world. And he really didn't traffic drugs into the United States as a lot of people might assume he left that for, you know, individuals like me, his brother, you know, and Fred at the time and other big truck drug traffickers. And that's what I try to explain to people that, you know, the cartel as a whole, it's, you know, the cartel is as strong as the people that are in it. Right. And there's different, you know, entities, which, you know, some will be on the business end, some are in the violent side of the end. And for him, you know, you know, he brought in a shipment of 20, 25 tons of cocaine at a time. And you had to make a reservation. And uh, in Mexico, you deal in cash. So um, he had, you know, he would give good prices. He was uh, a businessman, fair businessman. And uh, I, it was easy to deal with him. He was a calculator. Like, 
I I remember like I would grab my phone to like calculate a number or something, and before I even pressed the number, he was already you know telling you what it was. Uh, big numbers, like he was a, a, a one of the best businessmen. I feel like uh, there was in 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 that world of drug trafficking. I always got that impression that when I was reporting on this stuff back in the day, I felt Arturo just seemed this guy Beltran Leva seems to be the biggest one in terms. You know, he's not as, as infamous, but He's, but then he also has a reputation. I've heard some stories about him being a, on a personal level quite a scary guy. I mean, you hear the kind of you know, cannibalism, this kind of uh, stuff. Again, I think it goes back to it goes back to this. Uh, my personal what I've seen was that it's always about legacy, and, and you studied. I mean, you worked and you 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 follow the cartels as a whole. To them, legacy, who you are, your name, you know, it's always important. I feel like. You know, from my perspective, from my view of, of knowing him, that they got caught up and who, you know, the biggest always, right? The, the the question, who was bigger, you know, and he didn't like for the world or for people to think that he wasn't him, that he wasn't, you know, considered the Lord of the skies and that there was another, you know, you know, he self-proclaimed -pro boss of bosses. And... Yeah. And what he would do to show people who he was, was the things that you hear about. Violent. No limit when it came to violent. You know, he would, you know, do things to put exclamation points on the way he did things. And I seen that part of him. Again, for the most part, I think that it always goes back to my relationship with these bosses. I didn't want to be them. You know, I have the saying that, you know, in, in the States, you know, people get money, they get a car, a chain or whatever comes with that life. In Mexico, you you have a little name for yourself. You get a little bit of money. The first thing they want to do is get in a little army. They want to have sicarios and hitmen. And they want to play the role of the big drug lords. And to the drug lords, that's offensive, you know, to the bosses. You want to take my spot. <laughs> and they're treated the way they behave, with violence. Uh, my brother and I, on the other hand, you know, we're here for the business and they treated us like that and from had a great relationship, you know, with him. And I remember uh, one Christmas he called and said, you know, I got a Christmas gift for you. And he always would give away these like, you know, expensive vehicles, you know, uh, people don't know. I'm, I'm sure you heard about this. He would buy 25, 30 Range Rovers at a time. He would order, you know, 20, 30 pickups to give away as gifts, right? And uh, I'm thinking, wow, he's going to give me a, a gift. Like, you know, he, he was always generous. And uh, he said, I got 1,800 kilos right there. Sent from. I was like, like, boss, no, I can't. I can't. You know, it's Christmas time. It's like right before the holidays. I said, I don't I don't have, you know, the funds. He said, I'm I'm not asking you for the funds. I'm going to, you know, lend them to you. Front you eighteen hundred kilos, yeah. and uh, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna front you the kilos. But in Mexico, like I said, there's no consignment. And I said, sir, I can't take them because you know I'm told in Spanish, "Le boca del mar." I'm gonna end up, you know, not keeping up when you want to get paid because it wasn't like planned. And he had me on speaker, and he said, "And that's why I'm calling you." <laughs> he said, "Because anyone else." Would have said, where do I pick them up? Hmm. You, on the other hand, are saying you don't want to do it because you don't want to, you know, uh, leave a bad taste in my mouth. And that's why I'm calling you sent from. You pay me when you're ready. Now, okay, this is on the on the Mexico side, on the US, yeah, the on, on the Chicago side. I mean, you're running this massive distribution hub in Chicago. So people are all the gangs in Chicago are buying from you. People are coming from all over that the East Coast. Did you have to, I mean, how was that trying to run an operation like that? Did you have to end up using violence to keep things running there? Did you just kind of just, how did you manage to like keep everything such a big operation? To manage, I mean, the operation was, you know, when you go back to, and look at it, you know, the scale and the consistency of the operation, you know, we were trafficking anywhere from 2,500 to 3,500 kilos a month, you know, traffic, you know to over a dozen cities in the U.S. and Canada. Being on the business side, I feel like 
not only were we able to pick and choose like the right people to deal with, we, we took losses, but, you know, for the most part, I'd rather take that loss than actually, you know, resort to violence. That's how we actually um, handled our business. We, what we did was that we made it so that if anyone thought twice about robbing us or did rob us or, you know, try to take advantage of us, like they had nowhere else to go, but hopefully retire because they were not going to be able to sell drugs anymore because we are the ones that kind of controlled, you know, the drug trade, basically. So it, it was one of those situations where just because of the, the business and the way we ran it, it's like there's nowhere you could actually turn to, right? You know, without there, you, you're not going to be able to take a load of drugs from us or try to compete with us because there's no competition, basically. we I felt like we had a monopoly when it came to the cities we were in uh, because we always had the best prices and we always had the best quality because we had those relationships. And it took quite a few relationships, as you just heard about the people that were kind of in our life some way, somehow to actually keep that going. As far as our time and, you know, at that particular time, you know, in the organization, we were unmatched. There's no one else um, that could actually, you know, and I say this all the time, you know, to, to people in the classes that being successful at both ends of, you know, being in the United States and in Mexico is unique because, you know, this might sound, you know, cocky or, but Chapo or Mayo or Arturo couldn't do what we did in the United States. But yeah, I could do what he, they did in Mexico. That makes, you know, any sense. The American, the American side, that's the side which hasn't really been cut. A lot of journalists in Mexico complain that we never hear about how it's working on the American side. And that's the big complaint from journalists down here that hasn't really been told although that now we're kind of hearing it with you know your story and some others now I, I covered you know some of your your, your story back in the time in, in, my, in my first book and you know maybe I've got some things right or wrong there but my my understanding was there was this this war happened between Beltran Leva and Chapel and that started to kind of put pressure on your side because they were fighting over who you're working for is that correct or how did that when that war exploded in in Sinaloa and I was covering that around the time in Culiacan back in those days how, what did that feel like for you when that was happening so now here comes for the tricky part yeah as I told this recently I told this to Congress I yeah you know I feel like if I ever had an issue with anything that was portrayed was on the government side was that they took something that my brother and I did voluntarily and they shaped it into what sounded you know wh whatever they were you know wanted to uh promote was that we were giving out tomatoes that were threatened you know by the two most violent drug cartels the most powerful drug cartels i want to say in the world at that time which we were um again me being in that world since i was seven i tried to explain to this being threatened by drug cartels or members of drug cartels was a part of my everyday life we were under the gun each and every day. And you covered enough of these stories, knowing that that you you understand where I'm coming from. What always kept my brother and I alive, I think, was instinct. You know, we had already, you know, our family had suffered tremendously by that time. And, you know, my kids were getting older and I didn't want my kids to grow up like the way I grew up. And, you know, it was coming to a point where I could see the line being, you know, John in the sand, that's what people like to say that, you know, either I was going to, you know, it was going to come to, you know, a point of no return for us that we're not going to be able to continue to be who we were as individuals or and, and have that, what we thought was more compass, right, of not crossing the line, that it was going to get to a point where, where it was going to, you know, we we're not going to have a choice. And that didn't sit well with us. Um uh, I felt like, you know, my kids were, you know, getting older and I was seeing my kids being around certain environments that I didn't feel comfortable with. And it was only going to continue, you know, escalate, especially with, you know, what I seen was coming. And I think that for the most part, my brother and I, and, and it's hard, it's cognitive dissonance that, you know, we thought we were good people, you know, to us, it was a business. And it took, you know, Mary, my wife, who, you know, my brother's wife are both, uh, daughters of law enforcement who, you know, it's it's hard where it's like, they'd be like, no, that, you know, like it doesn't matter. You're, you're still not doing the right thing. And them wanting more for us for sure had an impact. 
And I, you know, I had one of those moments where I would be like, okay, but well, what's, you know, I think every drug trafficker gets to a point where it's like, I wish there was a way. And I remember I would pray on that all the time. And, you know, I say this, that I would be like, how, you know, there's no way. And, you know, I feel like I had a, a spiritual epiphany one day where I woke up with this idea of, of saying I could cooperate. You know, it, it wasn't easy thing to do. I felt like it was going to be the only way I could like rid myself of even family members. Right. This was all the life we all knew. And I wanted to do something good for my family. And my brother and I, you know, we talked it all and, you know, it was a risk that we were taking a gamble. You covered those stories back then. Uh, there was a war, of, you know, coming. And we were going to risk our life to cooperate against these, you know, powerful drug traffic, trafficking organizations and cartels, right? In the likes of Mayo Zambada and Chapo Guzman and Tulbachan Leva. And risk our life to try just for the benefit of hopefully getting some credit, you know, for our cooperation. And I think that gets overlooked. I mean... Everyone who's, you know, intelligent enough will say, well, you cooperated from March of 2008 to, you know, November 30th, 2008 against drug cartels. Yeah. Wow. I was in Mexico. Wow. Wow. In Mexico. Wow. Saving it. Yeah, so. Well, then the war started, you know, officially probably by April. And, you know, those threats came, you know, once the war started, you know, and it probably progressed. But I was already cooperating. The government for sure knew that we were threatened, but we were working on the cover. And, and I think that the fact that I risked my life to do the right thing gets overlooked. And that's the only thing I won't ever give up, you know, that thank God my brother and I survived. And, you know, if it was for a selfish reason or for whatever reason, I know I'm never going to be able to undo those wrongs, but we did it. That's the difference. You, now you did time in federal prison. Was it in federal prison you did time? And was it like, what was it like doing time? That was after you'd cooperated. And so you were still, were you in danger there? Did you have to be like segregated? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I turned myself at the end of two, November 2008. Um, it took several years for me to actually get my prison sentence. You know, I, I got sentenced in January of 2015 to 14 years in prison, which I had to serve exactly 12 years for. I spent in, in those 12 years, I spent almost three years segregated, which is probably the most horrible thing you had to go through as, as a human being, I think, uh, especially for me, who I have a twin brother who, you know, you're separated, you're put, you know, alone in a 24 hour a day lockdown, some similar to what uh, Chap was going through today. Um, yeah, prison, you know, it, it was a long time. I had plenty of time to think about what was going to be the next chapter in my life. Uh, there's plenty of times where, you know, you know, wish that I felt like I was always a little bit more intelligent, but I felt like the stupidest thing was that I entered the drug trade. Um, and, you know, I spent, you know, 12 years, my brother and I, and um, basically we're, we're placed in a WITSEC for prisons, which is still prison, just a little bit more. They add different security measures to keep you, you know, kind of safe, you know, as, as, as possible. So how not now you're 42 years old um, and you're kind of rebuilding a life outside of this world. I mean, how does that feel like, um, you know, what's it like trying to do that? How do you feel, you know, right now inside trying, trying to do this, talking to police, talking to the people who used to go after you, you know, what, what's it like trying to do that? And, and, and what do you see now in the world about where this, this is going with this trafficking and stuff? So, for the most part, having that time in prison, like my, my family has suffered a lot, some of through our own choices, you know, that we have to be responsible for. And I feel like I have this like uh, feeling or this need to do something with, you know, all my knowledge and all my expertise. I feel like there's something missing. And I believe in, in you know, second chances and redemption. I, you know, I'm a Christian. I believe that I was forgiven for my sins. And now what do I do with that, you know? And the Bible always says that you you share your suffering, you share your testimony. And I shared it already in a way, right, in courts. And But I think this time it was a little bit different. It's like, you know, to me, it means to me for my children, for what's left of my legacy, because I'm always talking about how these drug traffickers are always chasing legacy. I think I kind of I, uh, I took that and I'm like, you know what? I want to make sure that by the time I leave here, that my legacy is something positive, that I was able to, you know, leave a good impression for my children and, and for all those people who, who have suffered from drug trafficking, you know, that there is 
a way where we can actually make a difference and make some change for good. Okay, so you've got to the end of, of this podcast. And if you got to the end, then you're seriously interested in this subject. So come along and check out www.crashoutmedia.com. Get yourself a free subscription. Check out stories, analysis, interviews about the narco war and how to want to find a way out of this. And if you like it and want to support it, take out five bucks a month to make all this happen and get bigger and better. Uh, and uh, check out the other podcasts I have right here in the Narco Chronicles series. Uh, stay well, stay safe and see you next time.